Good morning, everybody, and welcome to CCF. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. It is very good to see you all this morning. Welcome to Christ Community Fellowship. If it is your first time joining us this morning, we are so glad that you are here. We are so glad you have joined us. And if you are tuning in with us on the live stream, man, we are, just, we are delighted you have chosen to tune in and worship with us this morning. My name is Joey Colbert. I'm the student pastor here at CCF, and it is our mission, it is our vision as a church to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that by learning from Christ, living in Christ, and leading others to Christ. Uh, my only announcement for the student ministry this week, I want to go ahead and put it on everyone's calendar, is Sunday, April 7th. All right, it's in the uh, it's in the in your bulletin. But Sunday, April seventh, we are going to have our uh, our church camp fundraiser. Uh, we did this same thing last year. It will be a dessert auction. Uh, so if you would like to make a dessert for it, basically what that, what that entails is you will bring it up here on that Sunday morning, and people are free to bid on it. And whatever money is raised, uh, all goes to paying for uh, for kids who are going to camp for their tuition. You know, if we take snacks or whatever. Basically, all the money donated goes towards church camp. So if you would like to make something for that, if you'd be willing to make something for that, I'm going to have a sign-up sheet next week, basically, so I can get an idea of how many tables to put out and all that good stuff. So just, you know, go ahead and put that on your calendars. Uh, I'm super excited for this. We're taking more kids this year than we did last year. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited for camp this summer. So for the rest of our church announcements, Ms. Lauren. Two quick ones. The 2023 giving statements are still available for pickup here at the back tables or the table by the kitchen. Um, so grab those on your way out today. And the new women's Bible study will begin on Wednesday, February 28th at 6 p.m. here at CCF. Thank you, Ms. Lauren. Well, as we said, we are so glad you have joined us for worship this morning. If you would, would you stand with me? We are going to go into a time of prayer and then we are going to continue to worship our God this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we are so thankful for today, for the many blessings that you have given us, Father. God, thank you so much for being who you are. Thank you so much for loving us, for sending Jesus to, to die on the cross for us. Lord Jesus, as we worship you this morning, God, as we sing your praises, prepare our hearts to hear your word. Prepare our ears, Father, that we may hear your word. Prepare our minds that we may understand it and hide it away that we may not sin against you. Father, be with Bobby as he brings the word this morning. Father, give us something that we can apply to our lives. Father, speak to us this morning. And as we leave here, as we go back to, to work, as we go back to school this week, no matter where we go, no matter what we do, Father, help us to have a kingdom impact and to glorify you in everything that we do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can see we're a little short today. Tiffany and Lucas are unable to be here, so we're going to do our best uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. If Sing you know, loud if and you know, If you know who they are, then you're showing your age. 
So. <laughs> Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus is singing for all that done for me who brings a chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy. is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, There is only one foundation we believe, we believe in this broken generation and all the dark you help us see. There is only one salvation, we believe, we believe.
crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems. Greater than the songs we In our weakness and temptations, we believe. Letting go of every single ring, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering, never changes what you see. I try to win the war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. A mighty warrior. King of the fight, no matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is, you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So when all things be my life and bread, I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't get as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. You ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I go. You've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I need you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't get the answers as I cry out to you, I'll trust, I'll trust, I'll trust in you. 
Yes, sir. I'm Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Nice to see you. Your name is? What's more important than names is branding. Tell me why you'd like to work for this company. What makes you qualified for this position? All questions can be directed to our website. I've taken three personality tests that have all yeah. proven I'd be an excellent worker. And your greatest weakness? My greatest weakness is also my greatest strength. And do you have any goals for the future? Excellence, customer friendly. Mm -hmm. Grab that by the horns, all hands on deck, cross platforms, no limits. <laughs> Tell me how you handle stress. Let it fester. If you can keep it hidden, then your life will be better. Let me show you a few no, things. Good. I think we're done. Our work is never done. So we started a series called Prepared, and the subtitle of this series has just simply been this, Defending Your Faith Without Losing Your Mind. Because as Christians, inevitably it's going to happen, you are going to run across people who are not interested in your faith. And they'll take little shots and little jabs and maybe family members at family gatherings, but they'll take little shots at you. And they'll say things like this, oh yeah, you're one of those Christian people, I forgot, you know, you're one of those religious people, you know, I forgot, you're a Bible person. And so, it's, and it's not that they're interested, like it'd be nice if they would come up to you and say, yeah, can you tell me how to be a Christian? You'd be like, you'd be all over that, you know, I mean, you'd love that. But they're not interested in that. There's... Just, they're not interested in what you have to say really at all whatsoever. So what do we do when there is little time and even less interest? Like, are there some answers or are there some, maybe a simple sentence, some one-liners that could make people kind of walk away from their little comment or their little jab and make them kind of think? Like, can you, is there things that you can say, and not just like snappy answers to stupid questions or anything like that, like nothing like that. Is there a way to respond to people whenever they make these little jabs and not just like be a complete, absolute jerk, you know? Is there a way to defend your faith without losing your mind? And is there a way to talk to people and kind of in many ways engage in these conversations without absolutely turning them off without just because sometimes when people make these little comments it just kind of like boils your blood a little bit it's like you could feel your blood pressure starting to raise up a little bit and you want to defend your faith you want to defend what you believe but at the same time you don't want to be that person that's just absolutely a jerk and so the apostle peter in one of his letters gives us kind of like a way. I think it's kind of a, a it gives us really, really good advice on how do we interact with these situations. And here's how, this has kind of been the launching pad of our series, and here's how Peter says it this way. He says, always be prepared. Always be prepared. And here's how he says it. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer for the reason for your hope. And I've said this every week, and I'm going to say it again this week. This is what Peter is not saying. Peter is not saying always be prepared to defend your Christian worldview. And always be prepared to inter intermingle your Christian worldview with your politics. And, and that's not what he's saying. He's not saying always be prepared to answer every possible Bible question that everybody is going to ask you because that just isn't possible. So was, it, was there really an ark? Was it literally a seven-day creation or was it a period of time because that Hebrew word day means a period of time and not necessarily a twin? Nah, that's not what he's saying. He's not talking about always be ready to talk about the book of Revelation and have every answer for what every symbolic creature and everything in it says. That is not what Peter said. And he also said, don't always be prepared to defend idiot Christians. And don't always be prepared to defend the pastor who ran off on his wife or stole money from the church. That's not what he said. 
Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for your hope. As if to say, that's a really good question. But here's what I do know. And Peter would say this way, always be prepared. And Peter would talk about the resurrection. And he would speak about the resurrection and the importance of the resurrection. The reason for your hope. In other words, be ready to answer this question. Why have you chosen to follow Jesus? That's what you need to be prepared to answer. Because you're not going to know everything that's in this book. None of us will. There's going to be questions. There's going to be tensions, what we call theological tensions. There's going to be things that you just can't package up real nice and easy and answer every single question so eloquently to where they go, wow, I want to be a follower now. So always be prepared to answer the question, why have you chosen to follow Jesus? Now, today I'm going to talk about what is really, I think, the greater, maybe one of the bigger pushbacks to Christianity. And that is this, it is the problem of pain and suffering. Why does a good God let bad things happen? Why doesn't God get rid of everything bad? How can God be good when children are starving and being abused? Now, here's what the, who, before we jump into that, here's who this message is not for. If you are in the midst of suffering, if you are currently in a place in which you are in a crisis of faith, if you are in a place where right now you feel like you're just right here in the middle of pain and suffering, this message is not for you. I mean, there's no other way to say it. You're going to probably maybe glean some stuff off of it, but this message is not directed towards you, nor is it going to be emotionally satisfying for you. And if you know somebody who is in the middle of suffering, in the middle of pain, and they're not here, this message is not going to be for them either. This message is going to be designed for us as we encounter people who are using the problem of pain as a defense mechanism. Like they are not interested in what you have to say, and they'll say something, maybe they'll even take a shot at you like this. Yeah, well, I believe in your God, but pff, he seems like he doesn't care about anybody or anything. They're not in the middle of pain and suffering. They're just using it as their defense, as their way to say God can't be real because bad things keep happening in the world. That's where this message is going to be beneficial for you. It's going to be beneficial for you to, as you encounter people who come at you with the angle of God can't be real, God can't be good, and they ask the question, is he really a good God with a big, huge question mark at the end of it. So that is who this is going to impact. Now, when I encounter people who kind of come at the angle of they're angry at God or, you know, maybe they're just kind of coming at it from a defense mechanism, I usually say something along this line. So the first response is just simply this. I'll ask them, have you ever read anything on that topic? This is the simple response. You ever read anything on it? And what I'm trying to communicate is this. There are people from generation after generation after generation who has wrestled with the problem of pain. And I just want to know, have you ever read anything on it? You ever read anything about that? And it lets them know, hey, look, you're not the first person to feel this way. You're not the first person to have this issue. You're not the first person who's ever thought about this. And I leave it at that. Like, I don't ask any other questions. You ever read anything about that? No? Okay. I'm just curious. And I go about my day. And what I'm hoping is, like, I'm not trying to be controversial, and I'm not trying to really engage much. I'm just trying to leave them with something that goes, that was a weird question. Okay. And I'm hoping that it'll open up the door to maybe some more communication. Now, the second response is a little bit more of an attention getter. And yet again, it may be the place where I stop. And here's my second response to people a lot of times. If you could, would you remove everything bad from the world right now? If you could, just, just, just wondering. If you could, would you remove everything bad would you just get rid of everything bad, everyone perhaps bad in the world? And then I say this, but before you answer that question, have you ever been bad? Have your parents ever been bad? 
children ever been bad? Before you say yes, before you, before you say, yeah, I remove everything bad for the before you answer, before you answer, you ever been bad? You ever known somebody to be bad? I mean, like, if, if you could, would you remove everything bad from the world right now? And here's the second part of that. If you have good reason not to do with everything bad, is it possible that God has a reason to? If you pause for just a second, is it possible? Is it possible that God has a good reason also? The Apostle Peter would write it out this way in a passage that we're very familiar with, many of us, and he would say it this way in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. And we'll talk about that promise a little more at the end, but just hang that into your mind. As some understand slowness, instead God is patient. In other words, what you want to see happen in the world, evil gone, did you realize your heavenly father wants that also? All the injustice of the world that you see, God wants to see that ended as well. The heart of God and the character of God wants to see that no more. However, he is patient and he is patient and he continues to be patient and I don't understand that level of patience. You think you're patient? This is a whole level of patience because if I were God, I might have already ended this thing and pulled the plug. <laughs> you better be glad I'm not. I mean, and, and many of you think the same thing. You're going, yeah, I'd have pulled the plug on this thing thousands of years ago. But he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The thing about all of us is this. We all want a can of justice spray. And when we see injustice in the world, we just go, get rid of that. When we see somebody being mean to kids, we go, hmm, a little justice on you, take care of that. When the IRS sends us a letter, we send them a big old spray like that right there all the way down. It smells good down here now. I mean, we want to get, we, we see justice, we go, well, that's not right. I'll get rid of that, and I'll get rid of you, and I'll get rid of you, and I'll get them darn Republicans, I'll get rid of them, and them Democrats get rid of them, and I'll get rid of, you know, I figured get more amens, but one of those. But anyhow, <laughs> yeah, just still out there sleeping, I guess. But we want a can of justice. We want to do away with that stuff. And then we also want a little bit of bad spray. When I see bad stuff, Spray that bad too. I'm going to spray all that bad stuff. Get rid of all that stuff. I see bad in the world, and I want to get rid of bad. But here's the thing, and here's the kicker. I don't want anybody but me to hold these cans because you might spray me. And that is a problem. I don't want you to spray me. I, you might see me doing something with a little injustice and go, well, there goes Bobby. Got rid of him, just like that bug. We want to hold the cans. And what we really, 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 really don't want is we don't want God holding the cans either. And that begins this, this dilemma because we don't want God to hold the cans. But here are a couple assumptions that I have based on these two things. The first one is this. Certain things ought not be. We all know that. There are certain things that just ought not be. Things just don't seem right in the world that we live in. And we all agree to this. It, it doesn't really matter kind of where you fall on this. We all believe that there, there's something bigger than us, and things just aren't right. And the other thing that we all know and assume is this. The world is broken. 
And everybody seems to agree on that too. No matter what they believe about God, everybody seems to agree that the world is broken, that something went wrong, that something is just not right about the world that we live in. But here's something that might be interesting that you have never, maybe have never thought of, but as Christians, we believe this, that this current world, though it is broken, it is the best, best possible path forward to a world that Jesus has designed that's better. And you want to know why? Here's why we believe that this world is the best path to a future world. The reason is this, because in this world, we will experience and learn things that only we could learn here. Imagine a world, just, just with me just for a moment, use your imagination. Imagine a world where there is knowledge of good and evil. There is knowledge of sin. There's knowledge of rebellion. And people freely choose to not engage in that. Imagine a world where it's like that, where, where we have gone through this world to a future world because this is not the last world we're going to live in, right? And people know, yet they choose wiser. When I was a kid, my grandma had an old Chevy Impala. It used to be a cop car. And inside that thing had one of those cigarette button things. You know what I'm talking about? These little things that you push in. And it pops out, and you can pull it out of the dash. It's like a little thing about that big, and you push in on it. And it sits there for a little while. It pops out. Bing! It's done. And you pull it out so you can light your cigarettes. My grandma wasn't a smoker. And so I thought that thing was so cool growing up. I would sit in her car, and I'd push that thing. I'd wait for it to pop. I'd pull it out. I mean, it'd be red hot. And I'd put it back in there, and I'd push it again. It'd pop out. And it was just con like it's just a constant game. Well, one day... I got really interested in it, so I pressed on that thing, and I was watching it, and it popped, boink, and I pulled it out, and I stuck my finger to it because I wanted to see how hot it was. My finger does not light like a cigarette. I'm just going to tell you that, just so you know. It smells different. It smells worse. I mean, it lit me up. I mean, literally. And so here's the thing that Grandma did not have to do. She did not have to send me to my room when we got home with my little old burnt finger and say, I want you to write on a piece of paper a hundred times, thou shalt not put thy finger to thy lighter. <laughs> she didn't even have to get on to me. She didn't have to say anything. Because when next time I got in her car, I didn't mess with it. Because I had a black thing on the end of my finger to remind me that that was a horrible idea like there's a there's bad ideas that you've gotten and there's really bad ideas and I think as one person said life's full of choices there's good choices and bad ones and that was a bad one I mean I learned now imagine a world where you know what you know and you understand what you understand about sin see God handed off a perfect world to mankind and we interrupted that and imagine a world where we know what we know about sin and death and destruction, and we choose not to because we know without a doubt our Heavenly Father's way really does work. You no longer are even interested in sin because it's just like that. I'll never do that again. You have lived through this world. You've endured through all of this difficulty. And imagine a world where people are free to choose and they choose your heavenly father. That is what we begin to look forward to. Paul writes it out this way in Romans chapter 8. He says, yet what we suffer now. And by the way, Paul, as we've talked about before, is no stranger to suffering. Paul understands suffering probably more than most all of us with everything that he went through from being beaten and shipwrecked and snake bit and everything else that you can imagine, being hungry and being cold and living outdoors, people hating him. I mean, you just imagine, the list goes on and on. Paul was no stranger. That this suffering now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later, future tense, 
For all creation is waiting, future tense, eagerly for what? For that future day when God will, future tense, reveal who his children really are. In other words, all of creation realizes that things are not right and looks forward to something. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Isn't it true that we suffer not only because of our decisions, but we just, dis- we dis- we'll get it out eventually. We suffer because of the decisions of other people. That you suffer because of decisions that your parents may have made. Do you suffer because somebody made a bad decision and it affected you? Whether it ended in something horrible happened. But we, we suffer not only at the hands of our own decisions, our own bad choices, but the bad choices of others. Someone chooses to be mean to you, you're suffering because of their actions. So all of creation is subjected to something, so on. So, but with eager hope, with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Now, here's the thing. I know this message is not going to be emotionally satisfying for any of us as far as the problem of pain and suffering. And here's why. Here's really the reason why. Because you still have enough stamp of the image of God ingrained in you that you will never be satisfied with pain and suffering. You still have enough, and this is actual proof of the image of God that God, I mean, Genesis story where it says, let's create human beings in our image. Like the Trinity is speaking amongst themselves. The God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit said, let's create human beings and let's stamp them with our image. I want them to be made in the image of God. And for that reason, you'll never be satisfied seeing pain and suffering in the world because it goes against the character of God. So this will never be emotionally satisfying. You'll never get to a place where you're just okay. You shouldn't, where you're just okay with this. There'll always be, as Paul said, this, this kind of this groaning in our spirits that wants and believes and hopes and looks forward to something more. And there's always going to be that within every single one of us. And it is proof that your heavenly father has a relationship with you, that he's given you something that is unique from any other part of creation. His thumbprint, if you will, his image upon you, which is very unique which is only for his creation of people, which is why the apostle John wrote the very last words of the book of Revelation this way. He said, and he who testifies to these things, yes, I am coming soon. And here's our response. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Verse 20, that last little phrase, yes, I'm coming soon, and we say, come, Lord Jesus. It's the thing that gets us through. It's the thing we long for in the middle of suffering, in the middle of an unjust world, in a crazy time. We long for this, oh, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, we can't wait for you to come. But in the meantime, some simple answers to people who are going through difficulty. Here's how I would answer. Short, short answers and then we're done. If God removed evil from the world, he would have to begin with me. But I believe God entered the world through his son to forgive me rather than to Remove me. I believe that Jesus died for my sin and rose from the dead. 
but not because the Bible says so. It is better than that. So in the meantime, I pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. That is how we get through. That is what you do when you have very little time and very little interest. Yes, I don't understand why all those things happen. But I believe Jesus died for my sin and rose from the dead. And I don't believe it just because the Bible says so. It's better than that. So in the meantime, while I see what I see and while I experience what I experience, I pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. And that is how we become prepared. And that is how we are able to hold on tightly to our faith despite all the things that we see, we trust. We want to hold the cans, but at the end of the day, we trust. And we put our faith and our hope in Christ alone. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your grace and your goodness. And we thank you that no matter what we see and what we experience in the world, that you Walk with us. You never let go. You never stop. You never give up. And so I pray that you will guide us, that you will lead us, that you will direct us. Help us as we seek to be prepared to answer the question of why have we chosen to follow Jesus. Help us to be better prepared for that. We don't have to be prepared for anything else really, but just to be prepared to answer the question, why have you chosen to follow Jesus? Help us to be better prepared for that rather than engaging in things that really don't matter at the end of the day. Help us to be able to respond with gentleness, to be able to respond with love to people rather than harsh. Lord, may we honor you, may we glorify you, in everything that we say and everything we do, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.